Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 558, An Unequal Mix of Good and Bad. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. We had a great time last night. I got there late for our Thursday night Zoom chat. Please remember, you are more than welcome to pop in, join in. Last night, because I didn't have my screen set right, I didn't even notice we had a brand new person whose name I think was Elizabeth, and I'm so sorry that I didn't see you and ask you what you were reading, and my bad. So come again, please. Today, I have several things for you. The first is a pandemic study. One of the contact tracers at work is a neighbor of a college professor. He's an online, he works at an online college like many people are doing these days. And I have a a link to his bio, but I also have a link to a pandemic study that is a volunteer study. They are running it off of a Google form. There's a whole disclaimer on the first page to read that just says it's a volunteer study. And by doing this, you're volunteering. They are collecting exactly zero data about you, name, address, phone number, stuff like that. So as far as that goes, it's anonymous. Yeah, if you're interested, they're basically looking to get kind of a baseline idea uh, framework for how people have been coping with the pandemic. What are the things that they've been most worried about? That kind of stuff. It took me about five minutes to take the whole thing. So, you know, these studies are always better with more people and more information. So if you have time in the show notes, go ahead and click on the pandemic study link and give them your two cents. Another person at work shared the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Antikythera, Antikythera. I don't even know which emphasis to put on which syllable. It's a Greek island. And there was this Antikythera mechanism. It's a mechanism that they found in a shipwreck that was submerged. It's thousands of years old. And it did really cool, weird things like it calculated eclipses and I think leap years and all sorts of stuff. It's a gear-based calculator. I don't understand. (laughs) The whole thing, not surprisingly, I think it had been made of brass originally, being in the ocean for a very long time, it was all corroded and bleh. And by using really cool x-ray technology, they were able to figure out what the gears were, what, how the mechanism worked. And, and they're like steps and steps. It's been a process getting steps and steps closer to being able to recreate one. So yeah, it's wild. So I have linked out to an article and also a video. So if your kids are interested in weird stuff like sunken treasure, this would be definitely something I would send or show or share with them. Also, mom, you have to skip ahead for about two minutes. Okay, I'm going to wait so that you can skip ahead for about two minutes. Okay, so I have two minutes to share this with you. Last night, I was talking about the fact that I have these old antique teacups that I had collected in my early 20s, and I was just going to have to divest myself of them. That being said, Tracy, who is a goddess, said, oh, instead of getting rid of them, why don't you turn them into teacup candles? To which I said, good God, woman, where have you been all my life? You're a genius. Thank you. So, I am linking out to a whole mess load of both videos and how-tos. Each one has a little more or a little slightly different information on how-to, and I highly suggest taking a look at all of the articles, like just skim through them, because I didn't find one compendium of best practices for this, but all of this put together, I think, gives you a pretty clear picture. Totally going to do that. Hello, birthday and Christmas presents. Thank you, Tracy. 
Did I do it in under two minutes? I think I did. Okay. So mom can start listening at any time now, (laughs) which I know if she's skipped ahead too far, she wouldn't hear me say that, but that's okay. The last thing I'm going to share with you guys is giant dog pictures. I haven't giggled like this for a while. Uh, one of the, my friends here, part of my mom's squad, paid a guy on, who's on Instagram. You can see a bunch of his work on Instagram. He's really, really good on Photoshop. And he's really meticulous with his ability to cut images from one picture and insert those images in clever, very clever ways into another picture. So what he does is if you send him a really good picture of your dog and a full body picture of you or your family or friends, he will combine the picture of your dog and the human. And it's great. And then he, when he sends it to you, he sends it to you with the, you now own this. Here's the high definition image. So he retains no rights to the image once you've purchased it and he sent it to you. I've got a link out to his Instagram feed. If you need a smile, please do take a look. And if you're interested, his instructions for how to get one of these done for yourself are embedded in his Instagram feed. But the upshot from what I understood was you email him directly. His email is there. Make sure he's on deck to do it. You know that he's he's got time, that he's not backed up. And then I think he uses PayPal. You send him money and the photographs, he sends you your picture, like within 48 hours or something ridiculous. Because my friend had it done and it seemed like she told me about it one day and two days later she sent me the picture, which is hilarious. So yeah, if you're looking for something very different for gifts, highly recommended. I am totally going to take advantage of this. I'm sitting here thinking, Does it have to be a dog? Could it be a cat? I actually don't know. You'd need to email him. I haven't seen any pictures of cats. He has dogs. So I haven't seen any pictures of him with cats on his Instagram. But he's just moved within the last, I think, year and a half. He moved from the upper Midwest to North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, somewhere like that. So it's been a big transition during a really weird time. And so he he hasn't been able to go out and you know, show his stuff at craft fairs or at farmer's markets. So I think he's had a hard time kind of drumming up business in his new location. So I thought I'd share his information with you. And uh, and if you're interested, please, please uh, contact him. And then send me a picture or tag me on Instagram or something, because I want to see what you did. <laughs> because again, it's a giggle. And now our book. Two chapters that I thought were kind of meh, you know, they move the plot along. I don't know why I thought they were meh the first time I went through the book. I did. I was a fool. Interesting things happen. Interesting Henry things happen in today's chapters. There are a few references to old things that we, at least in the States, don't talk about very much. One is, you'll hear a reference to a dimity bed, D-I-M-I-T-Y. I remembered this word, dimity, from my ancient past. I could not remember what it was and had to look it up. A dimity bed is basically a bed that has a dimity comforter or bedspread or counterpane on it. It's a sturdy cotton. The pattern is woven in. It's very nice. It also was very popular before Jane Austen finished writing this book. And that goes along with another thing that was popular slash in use before Jane Austen wrote this book. And it's significant for a reason, which I will fill you in on on the flip side. The second thing that was popular before is a bath stove. So I wasn't clear on the bath part, but the stove part is It's a a metal grate that was put in front of a fireplace, sometimes called a hob grate, H-O-B. And I've heard that reference before, too. I never thought to look it up before. It was another way of making radiant heat for a room. It was better than a regular old fireplace, but it wasn't as good as the Rumsford stove, which was more 
currently popular when Jane Austen wrote this book. All right, so that's important to know. You'll hear a reference to a bilious fever. Bilious goes back to an idea of the humors. Bilious fevers were things like cholera or typhoid, digestive, unpleasant things that you could die from. So that would have been unfortunate. I know we've talked about this in the past. I'm bringing it up again because it's one of those things that I often forget that the terminology wasn't general. It was specific. If somebody is sick and a physician is called, a physician is the person who had actual medical training. You probably at this point was um, going to Edinburgh for medical training or to the continent, the European continent. Physicians being trained professionals were more expensive than a doctor. And I even think probably more expensive than a surgeon because I think surgery was not, it seems weird, as well trained for as being a physician. So a physician coming to a slightly remote location to check on a patient would have cost some major bucks. A baronet. A baronet is below a lord, but above a knight. So it's the first title that comes with it, the requirement that you be referred to as sir and your wife would be referred to as lady. Unlike a knight, where the sir and the lady thing is true, the sir and the knightness doesn't get passed on to your children. Being a baronet, that does get, the title does get passed on to your children. So that would be like the lowest layer of that whole class structure with knights and nobility and royalty and all of that. Just so you know, baronet, below a lord, above a knight, hereditary title. You will hear the term Japan again used as a lowercase term. This goes back to what we talked about a couple episodes ago with Japaning, which was the art process by which you would black lacquer uh, cabinetry and uh, some other kinds of furniture, but often it was cabinetry or boxes, things like that got Japaned. So not liking Japan is really not liking Japaning, which is really not liking the way that furniture is decorated. It has nothing to do with the not liking the country itself. Something I don't remember having come across before, looking at a letter to see who it's from, there usually weren't any return addresses on letters. These were still just large-ish pieces of paper that were folded several million times <laughs> and then had a sealing wax put on to close it. And then an address was written on the outside. Now we talk about it as an address. They talked about it as an address too sometimes, but they also talked about it as the direction. So you would look at a letter's direction, and if you recognized the handwriting, you could tell who it was from. No need to have a return address. So if somebody checks the direction on a letter, they're actually looking at the to at this location direction and just checking out the handwriting. We have one more professional difference. Attorney versus lawyer. And I, I know we've dealt with this before, certainly in Bleak House. For those of you who listened to, to Bleak House when we were doing the premium feed, talking horn. But here's the short version of what you need to know. An attorney would not have had any formal legal education. So they would be kind of like paralegals now, who I know actually do have legal education, but they would have performed the same kind of function maybe a step up from a paralegal, they would have been dealing with paper, mostly. Things that didn't require you going to court. A barrister would have had a formal education and because of that would be considered a gentleman. So an attorney was just a guy who did legal paperwork-ish and the barrister totally enters into the classed world of things and is considered a gentleman. However, if in a book at this time, someone is referred to as, oh, I think that person was a lawyer, it could be either an attorney or a barrister. And so further questions would be required 
to determine if the person we're talking about is a gentleman or not. So there's a whole lot of implied context going on in a conversation that follows the phrase, oh, I think he was a lawyer. All right, that's it. Let's listen to chapters 24 and 25. Or if you are in a two-volume book and reading along with us, that would be volume two, chapters nine and 10 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the fabulous Mandegar. Here we go. Chapter 24. The next day afforded no opportunity for the proposed examinations of the mysterious apartments. It was Sunday, and the whole time between morning and afternoon service was required by the general in exercise abroad or eating cold meat at home, and great as was Catherine's curiosity, her courage was not equal to a wish of exploring them after dinner, either by the fading light of the sky between six and seven o'clock, or by the yet more partial though stronger illumination of a treacherous lamp. The day was unmarked, therefore, by anything to interest her imagination, beyond the sight of a very elegant monument to the memory of Mrs Tilney, which immediately fronted the family pew. By that, her eye was instantly caught and long retained, and the perusal of uh, the highly strained epitaph, in which every virtue was ascribed to her by the inconsolable husband, who must have been in some way or other her destroyer, affected her even to tears. That the general, having erected such a monument, should be able to face it was perhaps not very strange, and yet that he could sit so boldly collected within its view, maintain so elevated an air, look so fearlessly around, nay, that he should even enter the church, seemed wonderful to Catherine. Not, however, that many instances of being equally hardened in guilt might not be produced— she could remember dozens who had persevered in every possible vice, going on from crime to crime, murdering whomsoever they chose without any feeling of humanity or remorse, till a violent death or a religious retirement closed their black career. The erection of the monument itself could not in the smallest degree affect her doubts of Mrs Tilney's actual decease. Were she even to descend into the family vault where her ashes were supposed to slumber, were she to behold the coffin in which they were said to be enclosed, what could it avail in such a case? Catherine had read too much not to be perfectly aware of the ease with which a waxen figure might be introduced and a supposititious funeral carried on. The succeeding morning promised something better. The general's early walk, ill-timed as it was in every other view, was favourable here, and when she knew him to be out of the house, she directly proposed to Miss Tilney the accomplishment of her promise. Eleanor was ready to oblige her, and Catherine, reminding her as they went of another promise, their first visit, in consequence, was to the portrait in her bedchamber. It represented a very lovely woman, with a mild and pensive countenance, justifying so far the expectations of its new observer. But they were not in every respect answered, for Catherine had depended upon meeting with features, air, complexion, that should be the very counterpart, the very image, if not of Henry's, of Eleanor's, the only portraits of which she had been in the habit of thinking bearing always an equal resemblance of mother and child. A face, once taken, was taken for generations, but here she was obliged to look and consider and study for a likeness. She contemplated it, however, in spite of this drawback, with much emotion, and, but for a yet stronger interest, would have left it unwillingly. Her agitation as they entered the great gallery was too much for any endeavour at discourse. She could only look at her companion. Eleanor's countenance was dejected, yet sedate, and its composure spoke her, inured to all the gloomy objects to which they were advancing. Again she passed through the folding doors, again her hand was upon the important lock, and Catherine, hardly able to breathe, was turning to close the former with fearful caution, when the figure, the dreaded figure of the general himself at the further end of the gallery, stood before her. The name of Eleanor, at the same moment in his loudest tone, resounding through the building, giving to his daughter the first information of his presence, and to Catherine terror upon terror. 
An attempt at concealment had been her first instinctive movement upon perceiving him, yet she could scarcely hope to have escaped his eye, and when her friend, who with an apologising look darted hastily by her, had joined and disappeared with him, she ran for safety to her own room, and locking herself in, believed that she should never have the courage to go down again. She remained there at least an hour, in the greatest agitation, deeply commiserating the state of her poor friend, and expecting a summons herself from the angry general to attend him in his own apartment. No summons, however, arrived, and at last, on seeing a carriage drive up to the abbey, she was emboldened to descend and meet him under the protection of visitors. The breakfast room was gay with company, and she was named to them by the general as the friend of his daughter in a complimentary style which so well concealed his resentful ire as to make her feel secure at least of life for the present. And Eleanor, with a command of countenance which did honour to her concern for his character, taking an early occasion of saying to her, "'My father only wanted me to answer a note,' she began to hope that she had either been unseen by the general, or that for some consideration of policy she should be allowed to suppose herself so." Upon this trust she dared still to remain in his present after the company left them, and nothing occurred to disturb it. In the course of this morning's reflections she came to a resolution of making her next attempt on the forbidden door alone. It would be much better in every respect that Eleanor should know nothing of the matter. To involve her in the danger of a second detection, to court her into an apartment which must wring her heart, could not be the office of a friend. The general's utmost anger could not be to herself what it might be to a daughter, and besides, she thought the examination itself would be more satisfactory if made without any companion. It would be impossible to explain to Eleanor the suspicions from which the other had in all likelihood been hitherto happily exempt. Nor could she therefore in her presence search for those proofs of the general's cruelty, which however they might yet have escaped discovery, she felt confident of somewhere drawing forth, in the shape of some fragmented journal, continued to the last gasp. Of the way to the apartment she was now perfectly mistress, and as she wished to get it over before Henry's return, who was expected on the morrow, there was no time to be lost. The day was bright, her courage high. At four o'clock the sun was now two hours above the horizon, and it would be only her retiring to dress half an hour earlier than usual. It was done, and Catherine found herself alone in the gallery before the clocks had ceased to strike. It was no time for thought. She hurried on, slipped with the least possible noise through the folding doors, and without stopping to look or breathe, rushed forward to the one in question. The lock yielded to her hand, and luckily with no sullen sound that could alarm a human being. On tiptoe she entered. The room was before her, but it was some minutes before she could advance another step. She beheld what fixed her to the spot and agitated every feature. She saw a large, well-proportioned apartment, a handsome dimity bed, arranged as unoccupied with a housemaid's care, a bright bath stove, mahogany wardrobes and neatly painted chairs, on which the warm beams of a western sun gaily poured through two sash windows. Catherine had expected to have her feelings worked, and worked they were. Astonishment and doubt first seized them, and a shortly succeeding ray of common sense added some bitter emotions of shame. She could not be mistaken as to the room, but how grossly mistaken in everything else, in Miss Tilney's meaning, in her own calculation. This apartment, to which he had given a date so ancient, a position so awful, proved to be one end of what the general's father had built. There were two other doors in the chamber, leading probably into dressing closets, but she had no inclination to open either. Would the veil in which Mrs Tilney had last walked, or the volume in which she had last read, remain to tell what nothing else was allowed to whisper? No, whatever might have been the general's crimes, he had certainly too much wit to let them sue for detection. She was sick of exploring, and desired but to be safe in her own room, with her own heart only privy to its folly. And she was on the point of retreating as softly as she had entered, when the sound of footsteps, she could hardly tell where, made her pause and tremble. To be found there, even by a servant, would be unpleasant, but by the general, and he seemed always at hand when least wanted, much worse. 
She listened. The sound had ceased, and resolving not to lose a moment, she passed through and closed the door. At that instant, a door underneath was hastily opened. Someone seemed with swift steps to ascend the stairs, by the head of which she had yet to pass before she could gain the gallery. She had no power to move. With a feeling of terror not very definable, she fixed her eyes on the staircase, and in a few moments it gave Henry to her view. "'Mr Tilney!' she exclaimed in a voice of more than common astonishment. He looked astonished too. "'Good God!' she continued, not attending to his address. "'How came you here? How came you up that staircase?' "'How came I up that staircase?' he replied, greatly surprised. "'Because it's my nearest way from the stable-yard to my chamber. Why should I not come up it?' Catherine recollected herself, blushed deeply and could say no more. He seemed to be looking at her countenance for that explanation which her lips did not afford. She moved on towards the gallery. "'May I not ask in my turn?' said he, as he pushed back the folding doors. "'Ask how you came here?' "'This passage is at least as extraordinary a road from the breakfast parlour to your apartment as that staircase can be from the stable to mine.' "'I have been,' said Catherine, looking down, "'to see your mother's room.' "'My mother's room?' Is there anything extraordinary to be seen there? No, nothing at all. I thought you did not mean to come back till tomorrow. I did not expect to be able to return sooner. When I went away, but three hours ago, I had the pleasure of finding nothing to detain me. You look pale. I'm afraid I alarmed you by running so fast up those stairs. Perhaps you did not know. You were not aware of their leading from the offices in common use. No, I was not. You've had a very fine day for your ride. Very. And does Eleanor leave you to find your way in all the rooms in the house by yourself? Oh no, she showed me over the greatest part on Saturday, and we were coming here to these rooms, but only... Dropping her voice, your father was with us. And that prevented you, said Henry, earnestly regarding her. Have you looked into all the rooms in that passage? No, I only wanted to see... Is it not very late? I must go and dress. It's only quarter past four, showing his watch... And you're not now in Bath, no theatre, no rooms to prepare for. Half an hour at Northanger must be enough. She could not contradict it, and therefore suffered herself to be detained, though her dread of further question made her, for the first time in their acquaintance, wish to leave him. They walked slowly up the gallery. Have you had any letter from Bath since I saw you? No, and I'm very much surprised. Isabella promised so faithfully to write directly. Promised so faithfully? faithful promise. That puzzles me. I have heard of a faithful performance, but a faithful promise. The fidelity of promising. It is a power little worth knowing, however, since it can deceive and pain you. My mother's room is very commodious, is it not? Large and cheerful looking, and the dressing closet so well disposed. It always strikes me as the most comfortable apartment in the house, and I rather wonder that Eleanor should not take it for her own. She sent you to look at it, I suppose? No, it has been your own doing entirely, Catherine said nothing. After a short silence, during which he closely observed her, he added, As there's nothing in the room in itself to raise curiosity, this must have proceeded from a sentiment of respect for my mother's character, as described by Eleanor, which does honour to her memory. The world, I believe, never saw a better woman, but it is not often that virtue can boast an interest such as this. The domestic, unpretending merits of a person never known do not often create that kind of fervent, venerating tenderness which would prompt a visit like yours. Eleanor, I suppose, has talked of her a great deal. Yes, a great deal. That is, no, not much. But what she did say was very interesting. Her dying so suddenly. Slowly and with hesitation as it was spoken. A and you... "'None of you being at home, and, and your father, I thought perhaps, had not been very fond of her.' "'And from these circumstances,' he replied, his quick eye fixed on hers, "'you infer perhaps the probability of some negligence, some—' "'Involuntarily she shook her head. "'Or it may be so of something still less pardonable.' "'She raised her eyes towards him more fully than she had ever done before.' My mother's illness, he continued, the seizure which ended in her death, was sudden. The malady itself, one from which she had often suffered. 
a bilious fever, its cause therefore constitutional. On the third day, in short, as soon as she could be prevailed on, a physician attended her, a very respectable man, and one in whom she had always placed great confidence. Upon his opinion of her danger, two others were called in the next day, and remained in almost constant attendance for four and twenty hours. On the fifth day she died. During the progress of her disorder, Frederick and I, we were both at home, saw her repeatedly, and from our own observations can bear witness to her having received every possible attention which could spring from the affection of those about her, or which her situation in life could command. Poor Eleanor was absent, and at such a distance as to return only to see her mother in her coffin. "'But your father,' said Catherine, "'was he afflicted?' "'For a time, greatly so. "'You have erred in supposing him not attached to her. "'He loved her, I'm persuaded, as well as it was possible for him to. "'We have not all, you know, the same tenderness of disposition, "'and I will not pretend to say that while she lived "'she might not often have had much to bear. "'But though his temper injured her, his judgment never did. "'His value of her was sincere, and if not permanent, "'he was truly afflicted by her death. "'I'm very glad of it,' said Catherine. It would have been very shocking. If I understand you rightly, you had formed a surmise of such horror as I have hardly words to. Dear Miss Morland, consider the dreadful nature of the suspicions you have entertained. What have you been judging from? Remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, we are Christians. Consult your own understanding, your own sense of the probable, your own observation of what's passing around you. Does our education prepare us for such atrocities? Do our laws connive at them? Could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this, where social and literary intercourse is on such a footing, where every man is surrounded by a neighbourhood of voluntary spies, and where roads and newspapers lay everything open? Dearest Miss Morland, what ideas have you been admitting? They had reached the end of the gallery, and with tears of shame she ran off to her own room. Chapter 25 The visions of romance were over. Catherine was completely awakened. Henry's address, short as it had been, had more thoroughly opened her eyes to the extravagance of her late fancies than all their several disappointments had done. Most grievously was she humbled. Most bitterly did she cry. It was not only with herself that she was sunk, but with Henry. Her folly, which now seemed even criminal, was all exposed to him, and he must despise her for ever. The liberty which her imagination had dared to take with the character of his father, could he ever forgive it? The absurdity of her curiosity and her fears, could they ever be forgotten? She hated herself more than she could express. He had, she thought he had, once or twice before this fatal morning, shown something like affection for her. But now, in short, she made herself as miserable as possible for about half an hour, went down when the clock struck five with a broken heart and could scarcely give an intelligible answer to Eleanor's inquiry if she was well. The formidable Henry soon followed her into the room and the only difference in his behaviour to her was that he paid her rather more attention than usual. Catherine had never wanted comfort more and he looked as if he were aware of it. The evening wore away with no abatement of this soothing politeness and her spirits were gradually raised to a modest tranquillity. She did not learn either to forget or defend the past, but she learned to hope that it would never transpire further, and that it might not cost her Henry's entire regard. Her thoughts, being still chiefly fixed on what she had with such causeless terror felt and done, nothing could shortly be clearer than it had all been a voluntary self-created delusion, each trifling circumstance receiving importance from an imagination resolved on alarm, and everything forced to bend to one purpose by a mind which, before she entered the abbey, had been craving to be frightened. She remembered with what feelings she had prepared for a knowledge of Northanger. She saw that the infatuation had been created, the mischief settled long before her quitting Bath, and it seemed as if the whole might be traced to the influence of that sort of reading which she had there indulged. 
charming as were all Mrs Radcliffe's works, and charming even as were the works of all her imitators, it was not in them perhaps the human nature, at least in the Midland counties of England, was to be looked for. Of the Alps and the Pyrenees, with their pine forests and their vices, they might give a faithful delineation, and Italy, Switzerland and the south of France might be as fruitful in horrors as they were there represented. Catherine dared not doubt beyond her own country, and even of that, if hard-pressed, would have yielded the northern and western extremities. But in the central part of England there was surely some security for the existence even of a wife not beloved, in the laws of the land and the manners of the age. Murder was not tolerated, servants were not slaves, and neither poison nor sleeping potions to be procured like rhubarb from every druggist. Among the Alps and Pyrenees, perhaps, there was no mixed characters— there, such as were not as spotless as an angel, might have the dispositions of a fiend. But in England it was not so. Among the English, she believed, in their hearts and habits, there was a general, though unequal, mixture of good and bad. Upon this conviction, she would not be surprised if even in Henry and Eleanor Tilney some slight imperfection might hereafter appear. And upon this conviction she need not fear to acknowledge some actual specks in the character of their father, who, though cleared from the grossly injurious suspicions which she must ever blush to have entertained, she did believe, upon serious consideration, to be not perfectly amiable. Her mind made up upon these several points, and her resolution formed, of always judging and acting in future with the greatest good sense, she had nothing to do but to forgive herself and be happier than ever, and the lenient hand of time did much for her by insensible graduations in the course of another day. Henry's astonishing generosity and nobleness of conduct, in never alluding in the slightest way to what had passed, was of the greatest assistance to her. And sooner than she could have supposed it possible in the beginning of her distress, her spirits became absolutely comfortable and capable, as heretofore, of continual improvement by anything he said. There were still some subjects, indeed, under which she believed they must always tremble, the mention of a chest or a cabinet, for instance, and she did not love the sight of Japan in any shape. But even she could allow that an occasional memento of past folly, however painful, might not be without use. The anxieties of common life began soon to succeed to the alarms of romance. Her desire of hearing from Isabella grew every day greater. She was quite impatient to know how the bath world went on, and how the rooms were attended, and especially was she anxious to be assured of Isabella's having matched some fine netting cotton on which she had left her intent, and of her continuing on the best terms with James. Her only dependence for information of any kind was on Isabella. James had protested against writing to her till his return to Oxford, and Mrs Allen had given her no hopes of a letter till she got back to Fullerton. But Isabella had promised and promised again, and when she promised a thing she was so scrupulous in performing it. This made it so particularly strange. For nine successive mornings, Catherine wandered over the repetition of a disappointment which each morning became more severe. But on the tenth, when she entered the breakfast room, her first object was a letter held out by Henry's willing hand. She thanked him as heartily as if he had written himself. "'Tis only from James, however, as she looked at the direction. "'She opened it. It was from Oxford, and to this purpose. "'Dear Catherine, though God knows with little inclination for writing, "'I think it my duty to tell you that everything is at an end between Miss Thorpe and me. "'I left her and Bath yesterday, never to see either again. "'I shall not enter into particulars, they would only pain you more.' You will soon hear enough from another quarter to know where lies the blame, and I hope you will acquit your brother of everything but the folly of too easily thinking his affection returned. Thank God I am undeceived in time, but it is a heavy blow, after my father's consent had been so kindly given. But no more of this. She has made me miserable for ever. Let me soon hear from you, dear Catherine. You are my only friend. Your love I do build upon— I wish your visit at Northanger may be over before Captain Tilney makes his engagement known, or you will be uncomfortably circumstanced. Poor Thorpe is in town. I dread the sight of him. His honest heart would feel so much. I have written to him and my father. Her duplicity hurts me more than all. Till the very last, if I reasoned with her, she declared herself as much attached to me as ever, and laughed at my fears. I'm ashamed to think how long I bore with it. 
but if ever a man had reason to believe himself loved, I was that man. I cannot understand even now what she would be at, for there could be no need for my being played off to make her secure of Tilney. We parted at last by mutual consent. Happy for me had we never met. I can never expect to know such another woman. Dearest Catherine, beware how you give your heart. Believe me, etc. Catherine had not read three lines before her sudden change of countenance and short explanations of sorrowing wonder declared her to be receiving unpleasant news, and Henry, earnestly watching her through the whole letter, saw plainly that it ended no better than it began. He was prevented, however, from even looking his surprise by his father's entrance. They went to breakfast directly, but Catherine could hardly eat anything. Tears filled her eyes and even ran down her cheeks as she sat. The letter was one moment in her hand, then in her lap, then in her pocket, and she looked as if she knew not what she did. The general, between his cocoa and his newspaper, had luckily no leisure for noticing her, but to the other two her distress was equally visible. As soon as she dared leave the table, she hurried away to her own room, but the housemaids were busy in it and she was obliged to come down again. She turned into the drawing-room for privacy, but Henry and Eleanor had likewise retreated thither, and were at that moment deep in consultation about her. She drew back, trying to beg their pardon, but was with gentle violence forced to return, and the others withdrew. After Eleanor had affectionately expressed a wish of being of use or comfort to her. After half an hour's free indulgence of grief and reflection, Catherine felt equal to encountering her friends, but whether she should make her distress known to them was another consideration. Perhaps, if particularly questioned, she might just give an idea, just distinctly hint at it, but not more. To expose a friend, such a friend as Isabella had been to her, and then their own brother so closely concerned in it. She believed she must waive the subject altogether. Henry and Eleanor were by themselves in the breakfast room, and each, as she entered it, looked at her anxiously. Catherine took her place at the table, and after a short silence, Eleanor said, "'No bad news from Fullerton, I hope. Mr and Mrs Morland, your brothers and sisters, I hope they are none of them ill.' "'No, thank you,' sighing as she spoke. "'They're all very well. My letter was from my brother at Oxford.' Nothing further was said for a few minutes, and then, speaking through her tears, she added, "'I do not think I shall ever wish for a letter again.' "'I'm sorry,' said Henry, closing the book he had just opened. "'If I had suspected the letter of containing anything unwelcome, I should have given it with very different feelings. "'It contained something worse than anybody could suppose. "'Poor James is so unhappy. "'You will soon know why.' "'To have so kind-hearted, so affectionate a sister,' replied Henry warmly, "'must be a comfort to him under any distress. "'I have one favour to beg,' says Catherine shortly afterwards in an agitated manner, "'that if your brother should be coming here you will give me notice of it that I may go away. "'Our brother, Frederick. "'Yes, I'm sure I should be very sorry to leave you so soon, "'but something has happened that would make it very dreadful for me to be in the same house with Captain Tilney.' "'Eleanor's work was suspended while she gazed with increasing astonishment, "'but Henry began to suspect the truth, "'and something in which Miss Thorpe's name was included passed his lips. "'How quick you are!' cried Catherine. "'You have guessed it, I declare. "'And yet when we talked about it in Bath, "'you little thought of its ending so. "'Isabella, no wonder now I have not heard from her. "'Isabella has deserted my brother and is to marry yours.' Could you have believed there had been such inconsistency and fickleness and everything that is bad in the world? I hope, so far as it concerns my brother, you are misinformed. I hope he has not had any material share in bringing on Mr. Morland's disappointment. His marrying Miss Thorpe is not probable. I think you must be deceived so far. I'm very sorry for Mr. Morland, sorry that anyone you love should be unhappy but my surprise will be greater at Frederick's marrying her than any other part of the story. It is very true, however. You shall read James's letter yourself. Stay, there is one part, recollecting with a blush the last line. Will you take the trouble of reading to us the passages which concern my brother? No, read it yourself, cried Catherine, whose second thoughts were clearer. I do not know what I was thinking of. 
blushing again that she had blushed before. James only means to give me good advice. He gladly received the letter, and, having read it through with close attention, returned it, saying, Well, if it is to be so, I can only say that I am sorry for it. Frederick will not be the first man who has chosen a wife with less sense than his family expected. I do not envy his situation, either as a lover or a son. Miss Tilney, at Catherine's invitation, now read the letter likewise, and having expressed also her concern and surprise, began to inquire into Miss Thorpe's connections and fortune. "'Her mother is a very good sort of woman,' was Catherine's answer. "'What was her father? A lawyer, I believe. They live at Putney. And are they a wealthy family?' "'No, not very. I do not believe Isabella has any fortune at all. "'But that will not signify in your family. "'Your father is so very liberal. "'He told me the other day that he only valued money "'as it allowed him to promote the happiness of his children.' "'The brother and sister looked at each other. "'But,' said Eleanor after a short pause, "'would it be to promote his happiness to enable him to marry such a girl? "'She must be an unprincipled one, or she could have not used your brother so.' And how strange an infatuation on Frederick's side! A girl who, before his eyes, is violating an engagement voluntarily entered into with another man. Is it not inconceivable, Henry? Frederick, too, who always wore his heart so proudly, who found no woman good enough to be loved. That is the most unpromising circumstance, the strongest presumption against him. When I think of his past declarations, I give him up. Moreover, I have too good an opinion of Miss Thorpe's prudence to suppose that she would part with one gentleman before the other was secured. It is all over with Frederick, indeed. He is a deceased man, defunct in understanding. Prepare for your sister-in-law, Eleanor, and such a sister-in-law as you must delight in. Open, candid, artless, guileless, with affection strong but simple, forming no pretensions and knowing no disguise. Such a sister-in-law, Henry, I should delight in said Eleanor with a smile. But perhaps, observed Catherine, though she has behaved so ill by our family, she might behave better by yours. Now she has really got the man she likes, she may be constant. Indeed, I'm afraid she will, replied Henry. I'm afraid she will be very constant, unless a baronet should come in her way. That is Frederick's only chance. I will get the bath paper and look over the arrivals. You think it's all for ambition, then? And upon my word, there are some things that seem very like it. I cannot forget that when she first knew what my father would do for them, she seemed quite disappointed that it was not more. I never was so deceived in anyone's character in my life before. Among all the great variety that you have known and studied. My own disappointment and loss in her is very great, but as for poor James, I suppose he will hardly ever recover it. Your brother is certainly very much to be pitied at present, but we must not in our concern for his sufferings undervalue yours. You feel, I suppose, that in losing Isabella you lose half yourself. You feel a void in your heart which nothing else can occupy. Society is becoming irksome, and as for the amusements in which you were wont to share at Bath, the very idea of them without her is abhorrent. You would not, for example, now go to a ball for the world. You feel that you have no longer any friend to whom you can speak with unreserve, on whose regard you can place dependence, or whose counsel in any difficulty you could rely on. You feel all this? No, said Catherine after a few moments' reflection. I do not, ought I? To say the truth, I am hurt and grieved that I cannot still love her, that I am never to hear from her, perhaps never to see her again. But I do not feel so very much afflicted as one would have thought. You feel as you always do, what is most to the credit of human nature. Such feelings ought to be investigated that they may know themselves. Catherine, by some chance or other, found her spirit so very much relieved by this conversation that she could not regret her being led on, though so unaccountably, to mention the circumstance which had produced it. Whew, okay. Lots has happened. See why I said I don't know why I thought this was kind of meh chapters. Let's go back to the beginning. So in the beginning, we have Catherine doing everything she can to go and see Eleanor's mom's room. This is where we get the dimity bed and the bath stove. Here's why it mattered contextually 
that these things were popular a while ago. If you calculate around, and Jane Austen has been very, very careful with all of her calculations, whether it's holidays, length of days, time spans to get to certain times of the year, and distances between places, and how fast horses can travel, she's been very, very good about calculating all of this stuff in some crazy amount of specificity. Here's another instance where she's done that. Dimity bedspreads were popular around the time that Eleanor and Henry's mother would have died. It hasn't been replaced with something more modern and newer and perhaps more fashionable. The bath stove, the hob grate, was in use and popular at the time of the mother's death as well, even though the Rumsford stove had just recently come out. Now, the rest of the house seems to have been upgraded with Rumsford stoves, but not this room, because nobody's been in this room. So there was no reason to pay for it being upgraded. So again, just these little context clues that Austin is is giving us. Now, Henry catching Catherine, catching her out and, and figuring out that she's experiencing these flights of fancy, and I put that in air quotes, around the idea that Eleanor and, and Henry's father in some way contributed to the death of their mother. It's such a gothic novel trope that it's not a surprise. And when I first went through the book, I kind of heard this, this scene where Henry calls her out as almost um, like the scene from Emma where Mr. Knightley chews Emma out for her, her bad behavior with Miss Bates. And there is, this, I think, a certain amount of accuracy with that parallel. However, I think Mr. Knightley's bounce back from that position isn't quite as clear and, and maybe not even as immediate as Henry's bounce back is here. And I think that there's a specific reason for that. On their way to Northanger Abbey, when Henry and Catherine were together in the carriage, Henry had that wonderful, ridiculous, goofy monologue where he was monologuing all of the gothic elements that she should or could be expecting to see when they get to the Abbey. He, of course, knowing that none of it was real, true, or accurate, or even sort of matched anything except for the basic exterior of the house. I mean, even the windows in the mother's room are sash windows. They're not those gothic leaded panes in the diamond shape. You know, it's completely modern for the time. So for Catherine to have kind of gone overboard with this, ooh, I wonder, ooh, maybe, melodrama, Henry's a, a very introspective and thoughtful person. And by that, I mean, he is full of thought. He thinks a lot. He also think, seems to think a lot about people and motivation. He has certainly demonstrated that before, which I think is probably not a bad idea if you're going to be a clergyman, because uh, when people come to you for help and guidance, you will probably have some insight for them. That being said, I think Henry realizes that he is in some way culpable for Catherine having gone down this twisty road. And so when she re-enters the room after having been mortified and embarrassed and, and horrified by her own behavior, she now finds him to be more generous of spirit and amenable to her and not being judgy about her, which is lovely and, and important. The other thing that I thought was interesting with it was that when we get the letter from James, we find out that he is just as melodramatic and naive as Catherine. <laughs> and naive, I say, because he doesn't seem to realize that Thorpe is just as big a jerk as Isabella. So, so the, the next thing that Henry did after the revelation of James's letter, the next interesting thing that I thought he did was after they, he and Eleanor kind of come to terms with the reality of the situation. Henry says, after making it clear that his his brother is up a bad creek without any kind of paddle, he turns to his sister and says, prepare for your sister-in-law, Eleanor, and such a sister-in-law as you must delight in. Now, I expected him to get snarky here. 
But instead, he says, open, candid, artless, guileless, with affections strong but simple, forming no pretensions and knowing no disguise. Okay, if that's snark, that is an amazing double entendre snark, because that is not Isabella, but that is absolutely Catherine. So is this code for he's going to propose to Catherine? We don't know. We do know that he is not such a lousy judge of character as to think that any of those things would apply to Isabella. So I thought that was interesting. And then there's another interesting Henry moment, I thought, a page later. I don't think he's being snarky or mean. I think he is waxing on about something that he cares about, which is people and how people feel. So when he, he says, your, your brother is much to be pitied, but don't undervalue your own feelings. And then he goes through this kind of laundry list of all the ways you could feel after losing a friend, basically because they've, they've betrayed you somehow. And at the end of it, he says, you feel all this. And it's a question mark. And she says, no, I don't. Should I? And this tells us everything we need to know about Catherine and her relationship with Isabella, because we saw how Catherine responded when she felt that Eleanor and Henry had been slighted by Isabella's behavior. You know, she raced through town into their home, pushing aside the doorman and everything, and made her peace with them. Here she's not feeling at all that upset for herself, for her loss of Isabella. This is Henry once again using tropes of the time, and especially of Gothic novels. A true heroine in a Gothic novel would have felt all of those feelings, the betrayal, the idea that you couldn't possibly go to a dance, all of this stuff, you know, the, the back of the hand to the forehead, the swooning, the, oh, you know, I'm so melancholy, I can't possibly dot, 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 fill in the blank. He's providing the script for her for how she should feel were she a Gothic heroine, and she is not that person. So once again, she's failed to live up to the gothic heroine persona, but in doing so has proven herself to be a much more likable and honestly better person. And this is one of the things that I have loved about Jane Austen books. And I have a feeling that this has something to do with her longevity and popularity forever since these books came out. And it is this. She's very careful not to make her good people perfect, or her bad people completely vile. Every heroine or hero, ingenue or leading man in her stories, they have their good points and they have their bad points. Maybe an unequal mixture, maybe more good than bad, but they are never perfect. And the same goes true for the bad people. There are things they do or say that redeem them somewhat and make them complicated. It's one of the reasons why you can have Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy. And one of the big turning points in Pride and Prejudice is when Darcy sees how selfless and truly how, how much care there is from Elizabeth to her sister when her sister gets sick. And this is the, the turning point for him in noticing that there is more depth to this woman than he had expected. Here we have a similar thing. Catherine is not at all upset for herself. All of her attention is focused on her brother. And I thought that was kind of lovely. So, yay Jane Austen, yay Northanger Abbey, yay you for making it through another episode. Have a great week. Be well, be safe, take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.